Gino in tonight for Sean. Independence Day is right around the corner. And this year, President Trump is planning to honor America with a very special 4th of July celebration in Washington, D.C., complete with military aircraft flyovers, historic tanks, and one of the biggest fireworks shows in history. But not everyone's excited. Per usual, the mainstream media is trying to rain on the parade. Literally. Check this out. It's just obscene. It, it really is. And uh, I, I, just, I, I just hope it doesn't spoil the whole day. You'll see that this is really problematic to the D.C. City Council for several reasons. As a native Washingtonian, I find this to be offensive. I don't need a, t a tank in my front lawn to tell my neighbor I'm a patriot. So what is the message Donald Trump is trying to send by rolling tanks down Constitution Avenue? Who is that message to? It's certainly not to tyrants, because he likes tyrants. He loves tyrants. It's not to Putin. It's not to Kim Jong-un. It's not to the Saudis. Is it to our friends? Is it to Western democracies, who he doesn't particularly like? Or is it to us? Is it to the resistance in this country? It's always a threat when you roll out your military. But it's to whom is the threat? And I suspect that the threat is to his fellow Americans. You heard that right. Joy Reid feels threatened by a patriotic celebration. Meanwhile, out of work, backup quarterback Colin Kaepernick is busy calling the Betsy Ross American flag racist because it represents the 13 colonies and in the 1700s, some colonial citizens owned slaves. According to the Wall Street Journal, the former backup quarterback turned social justice warrior called on Nike to remove a patriotic sneaker featuring the Betsy Ross flag from the shelves. And naturally, Nike was happy to oblige. No word if Colin Kaepernick is still triggered. <laughs> Joining us now with reaction on American values under assault is Fox News correspondent at large, Geraldo Rivera, and the founder of Skybridge Capital, Anthony Scaramucci. Anthony, it's good to great, see you, buddy. Yeah, it's great to be here with you. I'll go to you first. So I thought with Kaepernick during his uh, infamous NFL protest, he had yeah. specifically made the point that it was not about the flag. But right. now a flag appears on Nike's shoes, and it's about well, the flag all well, of a sudden. So, so Nike's making a strategic bet. They, what they want to do is they want to uh, go for the inner city. They want to go for the youth. They want to play the social justice court. So white affluent uh, sneaker buyers, they've decided not to do that. And that's against the Michael Jordan adage. Remember what Michael Jordan said? He said, Republicans I don't, yeah, I don't care. <laughs> Republicans, Republicans and Democrats sneakers buy sneakers. Yeah, so yeah. They're making a big mistake, and it would be a better corporate strategy to be more inclusive. Yeah. On the military, i got to talk two seconds about that. Yeah, yeah, of On the military, I was actually against it. I want to be very fair and balanced because I'm often worried about, you know, what Eisenhower said about the military industrial complex. And then I talked to several veterans today, and I talked to a lot of people about the Gulf War I parade, and I turned around on it. I, I view it now as I understand what the president's trying to do. He's trying to celebrate patriotism. He's trying to celebrate the freedom that the military has presented and represented for the United States. So I have to confess, honestly, when I first heard about it, I was less uh, happy about it. But once again, the president has way better instincts than I do about the American people. He has very good instincts. Always has. Geraldo, I'll go to you on this. Uh, is this the dumbest business move in modern American history by Nike? Are they just trolling all of us? I mean, why make an issue out of this? This was a ground ball. It's the American flag. It's not some partisan symbol. What's going on here? You know, uh, in terms of the Nike, and I'd love to talk about the parade also. Sure. Everybody, the whole world loves a parade. Uh, they only hate it because Donald Trump proposed it. Uh, in Nike's case, it just seems that they're just running so scared. They're afraid to offend anybody. They are so politically correct that they would unravel a deal that was well evolved and had uh, really no offense meant to anybody. Right. Uh, Betsy Ross and my family and I were in uh, Philadelphia recently. You pass her house. The uh, flag of, uh, that she sewed in 1776 is there out the window. People just relate to it. Uh, you know, it is preposterous to think that uh, you know, you can't honor our, what are you going to take down the Washington Monument next right. because he had slaves, Thomas Jefferson and so forth. Right. Uh, in terms of the parade in Washington, I have to say that, uh, uh, you know, I am, I am really, I, it, this is a symbol of the partisan, toxic, malignant atmosphere we have in our country. If you see how uh, Republicans feel about the country right now, according to these surveys, as compared to the way Democrats feel about this country now, according to the surveys, it is amazing. People on the left hate our president so much 
that they are willing to just put a negative spin on anything. How many times have you seen a flyover in an athletic event? Yeah. Uh, you know, everybody loves them, except yeah. and until President Trump is the one proposing it. Yeah, you get goosebumps with those flyovers. And fine was great, particularly I mean, Super Bowl and uh, Yeah, I, I remember and, as a Secret case, Service right? agent being exciting. at the World Series when George uh, W. Bush threw out that first pitch. I mean, there were no Democrats and Republicans. There were only Americans there at that point. Well, I mean, that's the thing. So you, you, you've got the polarity that uh, Geraldo's talking about, and you got a really bad corporate strategy on Nike. They'd be so much smarter trying to bring everybody into the tent Can, at the same time. You know, time. I hate to play devil's advocate, but, uh, you know, it's, it's fair at, at times. Some of the response I've heard from liberals has been, hey, Nike stock is up and their sales are up ever since they well, brought they Kaepernick the right, on oh, board. No, you didn't ask me as a capital manager. Yeah, I, that, capital that's where we're going as with this. As a capital you, manager, <laughs> when, the, when the stock fell off, I looked at it, I said, they're making the right bet. They're going to sell more sneakers if they do this. But here's the problem. you got to be long-term greedy in a society and a culture because the pendulum's going to swing again, Dan. And they'd be way better off trying to be more inclusive than just focusing on the short-termism of that strategy. And, and, and I, I agree with you. And, Geraldo, I'll go to, I, I agree with Anthony 100%. I think this was a dumb long-term move. I love this country. I bleed red, white, and blue always have. Um, I think it's a long-term, really silly play. But this constant reflection, Geraldo, by the left on the negatives of America, focusing on our original sin rather than the blood we've left on foreign soil in World War II and World War I, freeing nations, cemeteries we have overseas with our greatest generation left there. I get it. Every country has, has some form of original sin. Many countries in the world were born out of some violence or aggression. But the United States has done such wonderful things. What is with this constant harping with the left on the negative all the time? How is this a winner for them? Part of the problem, Dan and, and Anthony, is that we don't have unifying moments anymore. Look right now what's happening. You have our women's soccer team in the World Cup. They're going to the finals for the third year in a row. Under ordinary circumstances, we would be right on. We'd be watching in the bars and high-fiving and backslapping uh, each other. But because someone asked Megan Rapinoe, the captain or co-captain of the team, whether she would visit the White House if they won the World Cup, she said no because she opposes Trump's policy. So our, the performance of our national team in the World Cup, something we should all be extolling their virtue and our kids should be watching and wanting to play like they play. Instead, it becomes you like Trump, you don't like Trump, you can visit the White House, you're not going to visit the White House. It is, uh, you know, it's, it, it's melancholy, it's sad. Objectively speaking, the country is doing great. The economy has expanded for 121 straight months. Minority unemployment is at historic lows. Right. The wealth gap, uh, for the first time in many years, appears the, to be lessening. You know, there's great opportunity, the president's trade deals. When he walked into the DMZ and crossed the line into North Korea, right. everybody should have been celebrating. You know, yeah. uh, if you want to make peace, as Moshe Dayan said, you don't speak to your friends, you speak with your enemies. The president went into North Korea, the yeah. first president ever. Everybody should be celebrating that. But because this hatred of, of Donald Trump is so intense, it, he becomes the synonym for the nation. And I think it's very distressing. People should get over themselves. I mean, as a kid, you watch those Fourth of July parades, you get a tear in your eye watching the old veterans, the World War I guy, then the World War II guy, and they die off, and then you're watching the Korea War. I mean, it's a wonderful, life-affirming, uniting moment, and here we're making it a bunch of crap. Yeah. Geraldo, Anthony, thanks a lot. It's really appreciate Happy Fourth of July. Thanks yeah. a lot. Yeah, happy okay. Independence Day to you. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez visited a migrant holding center in Texas, sparking a firestorm of controversy after she claimed to have witnessed mistreatment by guards and unspeakable living conditions for detainees. Fox News correspondent Trace Gallagher joins us live from our West Coast newsroom with the latest. Trace. And Dan, nobody is disputing that border facilities are unable to accommodate the crush of migrant families that have descended on the border. In fact, a report from the Homeland Security Inspector General says the problem is a negative for everyone. Quoting here, we are concerned that overcrowding and prolonged detention represent an immediate risk to the health and safety of DHS agents and officers and to those detained. But the comments made by members of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus after touring the facility have brought this to an entirely different level. Watch. They put them in a room with no running water, and these women were being told by CBP officers to drink out of the toilet. 
And tonight on Twitter, Ocasio-Cortez again used the highly controversial concentration camp comparison. But border officials are pushing back hard, saying everybody has access to fresh water and nobody has been told to drink from toilets. The Reverend Samuel Rodriguez, president of the National Hispanic Christian Leadership Conference, toured the same facilities at the very same time as the Congressional Hispanic Caucus and said, quoting, we found no soiled diapers, no deplorable conditions, and no lack of basic necessities. The Reverend went on to say he was shocked by the misinformation by some members of Congress. And breaking tonight, Dan, despite a backlog of some 800,000 asylum cases in the U.S. immigration courts, a U.S. district judge in Seattle has now blocked a Trump administration policy that would have kept asylum seekers in custody pending their court dates. The move was meant to deter asylum seekers from coming to the U.S. It will likely be appealed by the Justice Department very soon. Dan. Trace, thanks a lot. Not to be outdone by other Democrats' immigration craziness, today 2020 candidate Cory Booker, who's trailing in the polls, announced a plan to, quote, virtually eliminate, eliminate immigrant detention and expand protections for illegal immigrants through an executive order on day one as president. Joining us now with more is Fox News contributor Sarah Carter and Arizona Congressman Andy Biggs. Sarah, I'll, I'll go to you first. You know what's kind of interesting about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez um, and her, her protests here is she voted against some of the money to go down and, and, and alleviate some of the conditions <laughs> she's complaining about. And not only that, Sarah, she also celebrated Wayfair employees who walked out while the company was trying to sell beds to get children off the floor in these facilities. Am, am I misreporting this? <laughs> no, you're not misreporting anything, Dan. Who is misreporting is Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She's the one that's misrepresenting herself and misrepresenting what she saw with the Border Patrol agents in Texas. I was on the phone all day today as well, talking to agents in Texas, in Arizona, about the claims that she made. They are absolutely false, they say, because mainly they have video cameras inside all of these facilities. So if people were forced to drink out of toilets or if agents mistreated the people that were being held, then they would see that on these tapes and they have seen no such thing. So right there, she needs to come clean and talk about like she did when she said they weren't getting shampoo and toiletries. She eventually had to come clean and had to admit, yes, that the Border Patrol agents, that, uh, you know, Department of Homeland Security is providing those 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 uh, products and and those nests, those toiletries to the people who are crossing the border. It's absolutely insane. No, it is. Congressman, I have decent sources in Border Patrol. I'm, I'm sure with your job, you do as well. I've heard this story about forcing uh, a woman to drink from the toilet, which, if true, someone should have been prosecuted, is absolutely mm -hmm. categorical nonsense, that it's false, that she's just making it up. I don't know where she got this from, if she misheard something or if she's just making it up. But my question to you is, these are the same Democrats who, with them and their media acolytes, have told us for months, have they not, that there's no crisis, nothing to worry about, everybody look the other way. I mean... Uh, what are, what are we? I thought it wasn't a crisis. Now it's a crisis all of a sudden. Yeah, here's the, here's the thing, uh, Dan and Sarah. There, the narrative that they'd been living on was this manufactured crisis. It has absolutely crumbled. If you look at polling today, there uh, there's a ma majority of all people from all parties and persuasions that say there's a crisis on the border. So the next thing she does and her her cohorts, they come in and say, well, these are concentration camps. There's atrocities going on here. Those aren't accurate either. So what's, what's happening is they're being exposed, but they, because they believe in this kind of Alinsky-type method of, of you just keep telling lies about this stuff, you still keep making it up uh, to, to f facilitate their narrative because they don't want Trump to get a, a political victory. They are for open borders. And, and that's really what's happening here. And it, it's, it's astounding to me. But I, like Sarah, I was on the phone with my contacts today. Uh, they're like, this is, that's crazy. And it didn't happen. And, uh, and you saw that from the, the group of pastors that were in there at the same time. They said, w where's, where's she coming from? You know, Sarah, what's yeah. fascinating about this case, too, is how the Democrats always, uh, to quote St Thomas Sowell, the legendary economist, they always start the story in the middle. They say, well, these facilities are overcrowded and the conditions are deplorable, which, if so, we should look into. But then when you ask the obvious question, like, uh, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez, 
Why are they overcrowded? Well, we haven't done anything about Flores. There's no wall. There's very little was being done That's before right. Donald Trump in Central America to stop the flow. You were down there. You saw the report. Why, if we stem the flow, we wouldn't have an overcrowding problem. That's absolutely true. And I want to say one thing, and I spent a lot of time at the border. In fact, you know, for, for many, many years, I've been traveling to the U.S.-Mexico border as well, and not just Central America, but really working and watching what was happening with agents on the ground and a lot of the immigrants that were trying to come across. And you know what I can say, Dan, what I saw over and over again were agents that put everything on the line to save people that were crossing, people that were actually coming across the border, who sometimes were ill, whose first hospital at that they saw was a Border Patrol agent delivering them to safety or trying to help their child. And I think this is what is not coming across to the American public. Yeah, Congressman, you know, I saw a picture today. It was very touching. A Border Patrol agent in the water throwing himself into the river to save um, a young migrant child who is clearly in distress in the water. You know, granted, any large agency is going to have a few bad apples. I mean, listen, you're up in Congress. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you're familiar with a few bad apples up there, too. Uh, but the yeah. Border Patrol, these are heroic men and women, as Sarah just said, put their butts on the line every day. They're not getting rich. I was a police officer. No one's living the, living the life as a, as, a, as a police officer. I'm sorry. You're not getting rich there. It's really a shame that the Democrats have used them as a ping pong ball here for their political ends. It's, it's a shame. Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, Sarah's right, and you're right. You've got 17,000 roughly uh, agents and personnel in Border Patrol, and you might have a couple of dozens that are not doing what they should do, but the vast majority are, are giving their best effort to try to get this done. But don't forget, never forget this, that, that the people that are complaining about what they are making up, it looks like they're fabricating. It's, it's, you know, it just doesn't make sense. These are the same people that want to get, eliminate all of ICE, and they would like to turn, uh, get rid of uh, Border Patrol. They don't want internal enforcement of our laws. And so they're politically biased all yeah, the way. They are the problem. Sarah, Congressman Biggs, thanks so much. We have breaking news thanks, on Dan. deep state corruption with Tom Fitton, John Solomon, Greg Jarrett, Thank plus you. a one-on-one -on -one interview. I'm looking forward to this with Congressman Devin Nunes. Straight ahead. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Hannity. Breaking tonight, Judicial Watch has uncovered even more irregularities in the Clinton email probe. As a former State Department official testified under oath that he had major concerns about the fact that Hillary Clinton's team, quote, called out 30,000 emails back in 2015 and didn't follow National Archives standards. More on this in a moment. But first, a bombshell story from The Hill's John Solomon. In an exclusive interview with The Hill, a Russian oligarch and former Manafort business client reveals that he was interviewed by the FBI in the fall of 2016 and cast doubt on the phony Russian collusion narrative. But check this out. According to Solomon, the FBI interview was never provided by Team Mueller, even though it provided potential proof of innocence. Joining me now for reaction is Fox News legal analyst Greg Jarrett. The Hill's John Solomon and Judicial Watch President Tom Fitton. John, I'll go to you first. This bombshell story, I tweeted it out before. I was reading through it. Yeah, um, this is incredible. So we have a Russian oligarch with unquestionable ties to, to Putin. Uh, they were right. friends at one point. Oleg Deripaska, I don't think he runs from that. Uh, a, a metals right. magnate. Right. Uh, his connections to Russia are not in question. Uh, he's interviewed by the FBI, according to your story. And in that interview by the FBI, he is asked about this potential collusion between That's members right. of the Trump team. And take it from there about his answer and then what was not provided mm -hmm. to team, uh, the team protecting Manafort's legal yeah. team. It, it's really important to understand that in September 2016, Oleg Deripaska had some real credibility with the FBI because six years earlier, when Bob Mueller was the director of the FBI and Andrew McKay was working Russian crime, they asked Oleg Deripaska to fund a secret mission to try to rescue a captured uh, FBI agent who was hostage in Iran. So we go to a Russian. We ask him to spend his own money to rescue one of our own people. He gains a lot of credibility from that. So they show up at his house in September 2016 in the middle of the election. And they say, listen, we think Paul Manafort, your former business uh, associate, is coordinating with Russia to hijack this election. Donald Trump and Putin are working together. And he says, listen, I don't know for sure, but I can tell you, I think it's nonsense. The guy owes me money. The Russian government would come to me and ask me before they used them on such a sensitive operation. I think you're barking up the wrong tree. That is so significant from a discovery standpoint. And here's why. Uh, 
They go to the court one month later. This is in September, the interview. October, they go to the court, the FISA court. They don't tell the FISA court when they posit this theory that there's a, a collusion going on. They talk to one of their trusted Russian sources and he knocked it down. But even more significantly, Paul Manafort goes to trial. He's in the middle of this whole collusion and, and, and uh, corruption uh, question. And they don't provide that interview with the FBI to his legal defense team. That's known in the legal world as a Brady violation. And it could open up a new door of appeal or avenue of appeal for Paul Manafort's legal team. Yeah, John, it's an incredible story. Everyone should check it out. Greg, going to you here from the legal side. Mm -hmm. We've seen this over and over with the Mueller team. Potential exculpatory information, whether it's the alleged tapes of Papadopoulos claiming this, he has nothing to do with the Russians, whether it's Konstantin Kalimnik, who is, of course, connected to Manafort, and they make it out to be this nefarious thing until we find out Kalimnik was a source for the Obama State right. Department, too. We see this again and again now with Deripaska indicating there was no collusion and it's kept away from Team, uh, team Manafort and hidden in the Mueller, uh, in the Mueller little uh, Al Capone's vault here. You mentioned Brady violation. It's a Supreme Court decision, Brady versus Maryland, 1963. Prosecutors like Mueller must always turn over to the defense any exculpatory information. Failure to do so is a due process violation under the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments. Now we learn through John's great reporting, it wasn't. The Deripaska exculpatory evidence was never handed over to Manafort's team. So the remedy for that is to go to the judge and make a motion to set aside the verdict. You have to prove a nexus. So that will be the challenge for Manafort's lawyers. But, you know, it doesn't surprise me that it happened because the guy in charge of the Manafort case was Andrew Weissman, who has a long and disgraceful history being caught threatening witnesses and suppressing evidence. He is a prosecutorial terrorist, and uh, numerous complaints have been filed against him. And yet, here's another example. When I read John story, I thought, it's got to be Andrew Weissman. Has to be. Yeah, this case has been a disgrace the way it's been handled. Tom, I'll go to you. I read your report tonight from Judicial Watch, another great piece of work. So we find out now that officials at the State Department sounded the alarm about these 30,000 emails that had been culled like they were hunting off a herd or something like that. They eliminated these 30,000 emails. You know, why haven't we heard about this sooner? Why didn't this come out sooner? Where were the whistleblowers on this? Well, it, because the same Justice Department and State Department that were targeting Trump, as we're discussing here, were uh, protecting Hillary Clinton. Uh, and this senior official at the State Department was a senior records official. He saw that famous picture of Hillary Clinton looking at the BlackBerry. He raised, he raised questions about what's going on here. Does she have an email account? Uh, so he testified essentially that the State Department knew about her email system, didn't tell anyone about it. And then once they found about, then they found out that the, she had all these email records or finally admitted that she did, they allowed her to, on her own, go through and tell them what was government records and what wasn't, which was inappropriate. And it turns out they ended up destroying 33,000 records, including they tried to destroy classified information. And then thirdly, thirdly, he says they underclassified material specifically on the Benghazi case. So that meant they were sending out the door material that was unmarked as classified, even though they knew it was classified, further putting national security at risk not only to protect themselves, to protect Hillary, because they didn't want even more classified information associated with her account, obviously to protect her from being criminally prosecuted. Uh, yeah. Unbelievable scandal. More than enough information for the Justice Department to reopen an investigation and in not only Hillary Clinton's misconduct, but frankly, Obama government official misconduct, certainly at the State Department. John, Tom, Greg, thanks a lot. Also developing, the Washington Post is out with a new piece this week, casting doubt on claims from Congressman Devin Nunes and others about mysterious Maltese professor Joseph Mifsud having ties to Western intelligence. Remember, Mifsud was at the center of the case against George Papadopoulos. And while Jim Comey cast him as a Russian agent, Mueller's report makes no such claim and questions about whether or not Mifsud has undisclosed ties to the West have yet to be answered. Here to respond to all of this is ranking member of the House Intelligence Committee, Republican Congressman Devin Nunes. Congressman Nunes, it's really great to talk to you, your work on this case. Um, I think when we look back on it, you'll be remembered for it. You've done some incredible work, and I deeply appreciate it. Having said that, 
The core of the conspiracy theory against Donald Trump has been that Joseph Mifsud had some ties to the Russian government, relayed information to Trump campaign member George Papadopoulos, and that set off this tide of the FBI investigatory trail. But Congressman, Bob Mueller, after millions of dollars, 500 search warrants, multiple FBI agents interviewing people, makes no such claim in his report. He says Mifsud has Russian connections. That's far different than him being a Russian agent. What are we missing here? Well, you know, John, you know, Dan, there's always this saying uh, where there's smoke, there's fire. But in this case, there's not even smoke. Uh, there's not even any ashes. Uh, the fact that Joseph Misford, who was a Maltese diplomat before he was a professor, uh, he's seen in pictures with people like Boris Johnson. He's leading uh, talks at NATO. He's involved with with many uh, U.S. agencies, including the State Department and the FBI. And, and let's just top it off with this. In early 2017, as the House Intelligence Committee is beginning our investigation, just steps away from that investigation, Joseph Mifsud was, guess where? In the U.S. Capitol at the invitation of the State Department or a group associated with the State Department, members of Congress were there. So, uh, look, the fact that Joseph Mifsud knows some Russians, yeah, I think that's uh, very likely. Uh, the fact that Mueller ignores certain documents uh, that he actually uses, he uses pieces of, of news stories in his, what I call the Mueller dossier, the Mueller report. And in those same news reports, Dan, you have evidence in the news report where they call him these writers that they thought were good enough to use for, to make one point. They don't use the fact that those writers claim that he was a Western intelligence asset. So this whole misfit thing has stunk for a long time. It makes no sense. I have no idea whether or not if he's a Russian asset or a Western intelligence asset or a, or a double agent or what. All I know is that after $40 million, we still don't know any more than we knew before. And this is supposedly the guy that knew about the Clinton emails. And Congressman, one of the suspicious pieces I found in the Washington Post report is they go, they, they emphasize at length Mifsud's efforts to cultivate relationships with Russians. Well, if he was a Russian asset, then why is he cultivating relationships? I mean, do you understand how that doesn't make any sense? So on one hand, you're telling yeah. us Mifsud's the key figure in a Russian exchange of information with the Trump team to win an election. And on the other hand, in the Washington Post, you're reporting that he's still taking trips to Russia, trying to ingratiate himself to people. I mean, both of those stories can't be true at the same time. Well, the other weird thing about this, too, Dan, is, is that you have the mainstream media who got this totally wrong. They were wrong about the hoax. Uh, you talk about it on your show all the time. You've written a book on it. The many people that you just had on the, on just before us have talked about this. When are they just going to give it up? Like these are Russian hoaxers. Like what on earth is the Washington Post doing? You know, jumping back into the Russia hoax water. Uh, and I think what they found is they look foolish again because look, the only guy that we know that has said for sure that Mifsud is a Russian asset is guess who? James Comey, yep, just about it. a month ago, in the pages of the Washington Post. And so then the Washington Post, decided, you know, they have all of their, their supposed uh, sources that they don't name. I mean, none of, none of this makes any sense, but I don't understand why the mainstream media continues to jump into these waters. Why don't they actually try to go get the truth, yeah. right? They, they, interview, uh, what some, they interview a lady uh, in, the, in the story uh, that's, that's at one time had affiliation. She's a UK citizen. Uh, Sam, Sambai or Samber, yeah, I think is Sambai, the name. You yeah. probably know the name. Yeah, sure, Arvinder Sambai. Yeah, yeah. So, so why do you... It, so clearly she knows Mifsud, right? They interviewed her. Why not ask her point blank? You work with this guy, you work the State Department, you work with the FBI in the past. Who is this guy? Why would you not have a whole, you know, two or three or four paragraphs just interviewing her? She could probably tell you a lot on and, Joseph and, Mifsud. And so Congressman, I just got Mueller couldn't call him a Russian asset. I just got a few seconds Go left, but I just want to get this one last question. And also... Why isn't there some kind of damage assessment being done by the government if a Russian asset, Joseph Mifsud, he's been palling around with U.K. intelligence. Right. He was in the United States in February of 2017. Where is the damage assessment at this point? Well, there, that's, and that's been our major point the whole time. If Mifsud wasn't a Russian asset, my God, you've got the FBI, the State Department, the U.S. Congress, uh, all of our allies, NATO, Boris Johnson. I mean, they've all been compromised by this Russian asset, famous Russian asset, Joseph Mifsud. So, look, the fact that they're not doing a, a damage assessment, 
uh, Dan, I think, tells you and the American people all you need to know. Highly unlikely that Mifsud is a Russian asset. Congressman, thanks so much for your work on this. It's really been incredible. Uh, President Trump is already setting records in the 2020 election. We'll tell you how, how to get reaction from Kaylee McEnany, Lisa Booth, and Leslie Marshall when we come back. Welcome back to Hannity. 2020 is fast approaching. Democrats have fielded over two dozen candidates in a mad scramble to unseat President Trump. But many Americans are ready to sign back up for a Trump second term. The New York Times is reporting that Trump raised $105 million in his second quarter. The Times notes this is more than Obama did in the same quarter of his presidency. President Trump remarked about the 2020 field that his Democratic Party challengers look somewhat easier to debate than Clinton. And Hillary Clinton is casting a long shadow over the 2020 election. Trump critic Jonah Goldberg writes in a recent editorial that Hillary Clinton's candidacy was an inflection point for the country because it made the GOP turn towards nationalism and the Democrats towards socialism. Goldberg remarks, she'll never be president, but she's made history nonetheless. Joining us all to react to the 2020 News, Independent Women's Voice Senior Fellow Lisa Booth and Democratic Strategist Leslie Marshall, both Fox News contributors. Lisa, I'll go to you first. Um, we've seen this lurch to the far left. I've said repeatedly this is the gift of the Trump presidency is exposing the left for what they've been essentially for 50 years. I mean, I took some notes before I came on. It's, a, we, it's probably a long list. Right? It is. So I'll have to give you the foot. Right. I'll have to give you the cliffs notes. In the last few months, we've heard talk of concentration camps in the U.S., infanticide, 70 percent tax rates, health care for illegals, government run health care. The list goes on and on and on. I mean, is this really a 51 percent majority agenda in America? Well, I think the biggest challenge for Democrats right now is the fact there's just so many candidates and there's not a lot of daylight between them on these policy issues. So that's why we've seen them try to, you know, be out crazy, the other one, essentially, to try to get notice and attention in this crowded primary field. But about Hillary Clinton pushing the party to the left, I think what pushed the party to the left was the fact that they saw an establishment candidate like Hillary Clinton lose. You saw the DNC essentially back her over Bernie Sanders, and that infuriated a lot of progressives and people on the left. So I think you saw a lot of those types of candidates go forward in the 2018 cycle in, you know, more primary contests than Democrats are used to seeing, uh, and just progressives more fired up based on that. I'll go to 2020 campaign national press secretary Kaylee McEnany. Forgive me, Kaylee, for not introducing you. No You're worries. You're a valuable voice <laughs> in this conversation, of course. You know, this agenda I just mentioned to Lisa, which granted is not every Democrat. I'm not going to do what they do to us and stereotype the entire party. But these are issues that have come up. I mean, I'm just quoting some Democrats. Concentration camps, Julian Castro, 70 percent tax rate, health care for illegal aliens. Everybody raises their hand. I mean, how does this play in West Virginia, and Pennsylvania, coal country? I mean, is this a winner in these in, in this swing state like Pennsylvania? No, no, no. Far from it. Let's be clear. These are asinine ideas. They are crazy ideas. They are insane. When you have 76% of the nation saying, I want border security, 70% saying stricter immigration laws. And what do Democrats say? Oh, let's decriminalize border crossings. Let's abolish ICE. That's a great idea. Then they say, let's look at late term abortion. 6% Ab uh, support abortion until birth. And Democrats say, sounds like a great idea. We'll endorse that. They are becoming the party of the 6%. And they can readily take that 6% as we at the Trump campaign and President Trump take the other 94% in a landslide re-election on November 3rd, 2020. Leslie, I'll, I'll go to you next here. I don't see this playing in middle America. I don't get it. The Democrats have tried this lurch to the left before. I mean, history is there for us all to read. They tried it with Mondale running on higher taxes. They tried it with Dukakis. Uh, they got absolutely filleted at the polls in both of those elections. This is not a winner in, a national, in, a, in an electoral college national election. I mean, can they come back from this? Oh, absolutely. If you look historically in the most recent elections, including Bill Clinton, uh, the Democrats do in the primary tend to go to the left uh, because of their base. And in the general, they come more to the center. I think this will, will happen. Uh, I want to disagree with Jonah, though. This, the left pull is not Hillary Clinton. It is all Bernie Sanders. He got up and said he was a socialist. Some of his programs, the fight for $15 minimum wage, Medicare for all, these are embraced by all of the candidates and the majority of the Democratic Party right now. 
right now. And that wasn't Hillary. That was all Bernie Sanders. L Leslie, a brief just follow up with you. I've got a few seconds left. But I, I agree with you that in the past, both parties will move back to the center after the general. But now that's getting harder with the Internet generation and social media. It's all on tape now. Everybody raising their exactly. hand. That's going to be used over and over. That wasn't the case 30 years ago where you could slip in a comment here or there. I don't think it's going to come down to left or right people uh, looking at a debate and saying who raised their hand. I mean, uh, you know that in this, if we no, look but at the Lindsay, numbers, you know how the numbers show work. that the, but what's the, the, number, the, the numbers, Donald Trump campaign the, is going the, to play that. They're going to put that in an ad of all yes, those Democrats will. raising their hand, well, yeah, advocating Lisa, Lisa, for giving illegal that's immigrants. Not, but Healthcare. that's not also th one that's other not, key difference between now and between uh, this talk. election and 2016 <laughs> is the fact that President Trump's going to have a war chest of money. And so he doesn't have to just rely off that earned media like he did during the 2016 cycle. He's going to be able to dictate the terms of his message and how that gets across to voters. And that's going to be critical for 2020. Leslie, quick follow-up. We've got to remember, up. Lisa, although we have two dozen people, we're going to have uh, two people on the stage at the end. The I know, Democratic, I've on campaigns, you know, Leslie, Democratic nominee is going them. to dictate. May I finish? The Democratic candidate is going to dictate, and we're going to see the money spread out among 24, along with the DNC's cash flow, uh, definitely uh, come up. You have just with Buttigieg and Sanders, uh, you know, half of, of just with two people of what the president oh, and the RNC raised. Uh, I'm not worried yet. Ladies, thanks a lot. Really Should appreciate be. it. There's no doubt about it. Liberal cities are in crisis. Dozen shot in Chicago, a conservative attack by Antifa in Portland, and an exploding homelessness crisis in multiple major cities. David Webb and Alan Dershowitz will be here when Hannity returns. Welcome back to Hannity. As has been reported on the show, liberal cities across the nation are in crisis with leftist policies gone amok. Homelessness and poverty are skyrocketing. Lawlessness and shootings are on the rise. There's breaking news out of Chicago tonight as the city is facing turmoil on multiple fronts. Fox News correspondent Matt Finn joins us live from the Chicago Bureau with the latest. Matt. Dan, this evening, Chicago police tell us that it was a brutally violent couple of days here uh, over the weekend in the city. Between the dates of June 28th and June 30th, Chicago police report 52 people were shot. Five people were killed. One was a juvenile. And there were 39 reported shooting incidents just over the weekend. And in light of these staggering weekend crime numbers, Chicago police say 2019 has had a 7% fewer homicides than 2018, the lowest since 2016. Uh, police give credit in part to their gun recovery efforts. And in other news here in Chicago tonight, new video obtained by Fox News now very much appears to place actor Jesse Smollett and the Osandaro brothers at the scene of the alleged hoax the night it happened here in Chicago. Video shows one of the brothers in a red-brimmed hat. That's important because police notes indicate that the brother purchased a red hat to wear during the alleged hoax. Also, for the first time, we appear to see what very much looks like Jesse Smollett walking around the street in the same white sweater he was seen wearing when police showed up to his apartment. Jesse Smollett and his legal team insist that he is innocent, the victim of a true hate crime, and had nothing to do with a hoax. Dan. Thanks, Matt. In his interview with Tucker Carlson, which aired last night, President Trump talked about the chaos and homelessness in liberal cities. Watch this. You can't have what's happening where police officers are getting sick just by walking the beat. I mean, they're getting actually very sick. Uh, where people are getting sick, where the people living there are living in hell, too, although some of them have mental problems where they don't even know they're living that way. In fact, perhaps they like living that way. Uh, they can't do that. You, we cannot ruin our cities. And you have people that work in those cities. They work in office buildings, and to get into the building, they have to walk through a scene that nobody would have believed possible three years ago. And this is the liberal establishment. This is what I'm fighting. In an update to a story we covered last night, Portland police released photos of suspects in violent Antifa clashes that injured conservative writers and others. And according to Newsbusters, CBS, NBC, MSNBC, and the New York Times all ignored the Antifa violence and beating of Andy No. Joining us now is host of Reality Check with David Webb on Fox Nation and columnist at The Hill, David Webb and author of an intro to the Mueller Report, Harvard Law School Emeritus Professor Alan Dershowitz. David, I'll go to you first. 
You know, I, I always say the, the irony of conservatism is conservative governance in cities benefits conservatives and liberals. Right. Yet the opposite is true for liberalism. It burns liberals and conservatives at the same time. I mean, look at the Giuliani years compared to what's happening in New York right now with de Blasio. The city's falling apart. Yeah, I mean, the reality, if you look at Dinkins to Giuliani and what happened in New York, what happened was proper policing and law enforcement. That's not a left or right issue. And law enforcement is frustrated. I talk to officers in Chicago, not just about the Jussie Small that case, but about how they're policing. And, and they feel that the mayoral agency that runs the city doesn't have their back. It's not just the mayor, but it's the establishment. And now you're seeing the police in some form of a revolt saying, we just want to do our job to protect citizens no matter what. That's common in law enforcement, not the outliers that you, ser you occasionally have. And in the summer when it heats up, Dan, you've seen this. Yeah. The hot days of summer lead to a variety of things that increase in shootings, but robberies are also up. If you look at these ComStat report in these cities, you're starting to see it's a lagging indicator, but you're beginning to see robberies. You go to the precinct level, the complaints from the commanders, the day commanders. This is a real problem, not only in Chicago, but in many cities around the country, liberal-run cities. Yeah. Professor Dershowitz, wherever you see a, a liberal monopoly where they're in charge in these big cities, sadly, many times you see high crime, you see lawlessness, you see some pockets of poverty that, that seem unbreakable. I mean, what's the common thread here? Obviously, it seems to be this liberal form of government, uh, governance. Am I, am I reading this wrong? I think you're reading it wrong. I think uh, when Ed Koch was mayor of New York, uh, New York was a, a wonderful city. I live in New York part of the year now. I think it's a wonderful city. I don't support de Blasio for many of his economic reasons, but I think you way, way overstate the problems in New York and attribute them to one party rather than the other. Uh, Chicago is a different story. Chicago really has very, very serious problems. Some of the West Coast cities have serious problems, but I think they're endemic often to urban centers. Where I think we really do have a problem that your initial uh, uh, dis point made was about uh, Antifa. I've been victims. Uh, when I've spoken at schools like Berkeley, I've been threatened by uh, Antifa. And I really do think the government has to do something to stop extreme left-wing threats and violence to centrist, moderate, liberal speakers like me. I'm not radical enough for Antifa, so they try to prevent me from speaking. And that's been a real problem on university campuses. Look, we live in a federal system, and the federal system gives authority to the cities to make their own mistakes and their own decisions. The president really can't intrude on that except in extreme cases under the supremacy clause. We have to leave it to the cities and to the voters to decide whether they like what they get in the cities or not. You know, on the legal analysis, Dan, I'll defer, of course, to Alan. Great to see you, by the way. He looks you, pretty good for the, for the summer out there. But, you know, the Koch administration had done something, and I've had this discussion. I live in New York. I love it like he does, that Koch had a relationship and an understanding of proper policing and neighborhood policing. That's a key difference. Unfortunately, in these cities, that fractured relationship. On the Antifa issue, the FBI is waiting on them, their activities. He's right about the supremacy clause on a number of issues. I would never argue with his his uh, expertise find on that. It kind but... of ridiculous that Antifa calls himself anti-fascist as they go to the streets and beat the crap yeah. out of people. Kind of an interesting. And, and a final, if that's you that's relegate your, if you, all right, no, let's leave. Thanks, <laughs> Alan. David, got to run. Uh, wait till you see our villain of the day. That's next on Hannity. Welcome back to Hannity. Unfortunately, it's all the time we have left this evening. If you like tonight's show, you should tune into my podcast, The Dan Bongino Show. As always, thanks a lot for joining us. Have a very, very happy Independence Day. This is still the greatest country on earth. Raymond Arroyo is filling in for Laura tonight. The Ingram Angle's up next. Raymond, the con is yours, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Great show, Dan. I was hey. watching the whole thing. In fact, I Thank was so you, distracted, buddy. I got here late. So no. hang in there. Happy July 4th. We'll thanks, see you God. soon. 